Hello there. My name is Tord Kellström and I've been a professor of environmental and occupational health for many years and the last 10 years I have focused on the climate change impact on human health, particularly occupational health. But today we're going to talk a bit uh, more broadly. Uh, it's a brief introduction to the health panorama of uh, climate change and as you will see it has a lot of different aspects to it. Now we should remember that um, uh, the effects of climate change or the results of climate change uh, is um, primarily an increase of the temperature on average in the world. It doesn't mean it goes up uh, everywhere and it doesn't mean uh, it increases every day during a year. In fact the variability of the climate might increase so that there are more cold days and also more hot days in a particular place in the future than it has been recently. We have an increase of temperature, we have an increase uh, on average, increase of rainfall in certain parts of the world, while in other parts it gets drier, there's less rainfall, and that affects, of course, the health risks because many of them are associated with humidity or with the local access to water on the ground, flooding, etc. We have more extremes of weather, more storms are likely to happen and uh, when they happen they might be more violent and that will cause injuries uh, in a lot of people affected and we have working groups like the emergency workers who have a particular uh, problem uh, because of the extra risks of climate uh, change. There is an ecological change uh, which um, <coughs> links, of course, to uh, various um, mosquitoes and other insects that spread diseases and it also affects um, agriculture. And um, we have links to urbanization uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that. And the air pollution in cities is associated with uh, climate change and uh, the health effects are uh, different maybe from what happens from the actual climate factors themselves. We have a problem of uh, lack of fresh water in many parts of the world and uh, uh, this could be uh, for many, many people uh, really the most difficult part of climate change. And of course we have sea level rise uh, which is going to go slowly uh, but it will uh, eventually continue to rise uh, even if we take actions to uh, reduce the climate change. So all of these different environmental changes related to climate change have their own specific uh, effects on health. And you can read about this in the IPCC assessments that came out um, in the last uh, two years, 2013 and 2014. The next slide shows what we call a deep sea framework which sort of uh, creates <coughs> a way of looking at the flow of the impact from climate change to the change in the actual local environment to the exposures that people are uh, you know, faced with in this new situation. And uh <coughs> that's how we try to quantify the uh, risks that will happen or may happen in the future in relation to climate change impacts on health. And the next slide you'll see that we have listed a whole list of different health effects and um, this is um, a way to uh, show the uh, knowledge that we have about the links between different environmental exposures and the health effects of um, climate. And finally, the next slide shows uh, the whole package uh, together or the whole panorama together where we can see that climate change uh, affects a um, number of specific health problems but also groups of disease problems like uh, child health, elderly health, women's health, occupational health, etc. Now we should not forget that um, there are a number of examples of how the mitigation or the prevention of climate change via reduction, reduction of the greenhouse gases will in these uh, actions will in themselves be health promoting. We talk about health co-benefits of these um, actions and uh, 
uh, it includes uh, creating uh, systems for renewable uh, energy production and uh, new engineering solutions could be extremely important uh, if they increase the efficiency of these um, electricity production systems and also systems for cooling the air inside buildings straight from the solar, engineer, solar energy. We have uh, <coughs> the design of small scale systems that can be used locally in different parts of the world where they don't have access at the moment to electricity at all. And this may in fact be the most um, convenient and cost effective way of providing electricity for people in villages in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And uh, electricity is an extremely important contribution to the infrastructure that promotes health. We can look at improved uh, designs for public transport and increased use of what we call active transport, where you bicycle or you walk uh, to uh, <coughs> your work or your school or your university for the daily commute. And and again, uh, there's a big role for engineering and other design solutions that uh, are not directly themselves related to health, but which contribute to improved health, uh, even though the focus might be on reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, another variable which has been mentioned in many of the reports on climate change prevention is the reduction of the use of meat from cows and sheep in particular, because these animals uh, burp out a lot of methane. And this um, uh, contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions in a very strong way. Now the next slide shows the estimates that um, my team have made for the future heat levels in different parts of the world. In fact, the whole world is covered in these maps. And you can see how the areas with red color uh, goes up very dramatically from 1995 to 2085. And if we uh, include 2200 as an another <laughs> year, of course, it's very difficult to know exactly what levels we will reach. But if they continue at the level of business as usual, we will have very high increases of the um, temperatures and the heat levels uh, in this um, uh, later years of the following century. So the climate change is not stopping at the end of this century. It's also interesting to remember where do people actually live in the world? And the next slide shows how the uh, people are distributed by latitude and longitude. And you can see that uh, probably about two thirds or even more of the global population actually lives in the tropical and subtropical areas where we have the highest levels of heat already now, uh, over a year, we have heat uh, in some places uh, more or less every day. Uh, and of course, people have somehow adapted to this. But as the heat levels go up, it will be more and more difficult for them, particularly to work. And I'll come back to that. Now we can make maps uh, for individual countries of the heat levels. And that's another part of our research. Uh, and uh, the next um, graph shows you uh, the situation for India. And we can also get data from uh, specific um, uh, weather stations, like the following graph showing the trend in uh, Kolkata in India. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the, during a 30 year period from 1980 to 2014, uh, 2012, sorry, the, uh <coughs> the increase of the uh, WBGT, which is a heat index, has gone up only by about half a degree. It doesn't sound like much, but if you actually calculate uh, on the basis of the real measured data from this weather station at the airport in Kolkata, you can see that the number of days when the afternoon heat level, the WBGT max level for the days when it is higher than uh, 30 degrees, which is a very high heat level, which makes it very difficult to carry out work. Uh, it goes from 52 to 96 days. So even though the change on average was only half a degree, we have twice as many super hot days 
in Kolkata now as we had in uh, 1980. So all of these um, types of data uh, indicate that uh, already now there is a problem for many of these tropical countries and tropical places uh, in terms of heat during the hottest part of the year, which in some places, as I mentioned, goes on for almost the whole year, certainly several months. The next example shows uh, the data for modeling for a particular place. This is uh, in Panama City and uh, the <coughs> area around the Panama Canal. And you can see that the future modeling uh, increases the heat stress level by about um, uh, two to three degrees, depending on which model you use. And that will then uh, again increase, of course, the number of super hot days much more rapidly than the average trend of the um, heat levels uh, that are shown in this graph. The next slide shows another feature of the problems of the heat. And this is the what we call the urban heat island effect, that uh, in the central areas, the very highly urbanized areas of modern cities, we have a lot of uh, concrete, we have a lot of tar seal or asphalt, and uh, <coughs> sometimes we have uh, black roofs, sometimes we have uh, black buildings, and they absorb the heat from the sun during the day so we will get much, much higher heat levels inside the center of a city like that than the heat levels in the suburban uh, or in the surrounding areas. And um, the difference may be uh, several degrees centigrade, then two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. And interestingly, it's one of the feature of uh, climate conditions and climate change that hasn't been studied enough to give us detailed data for different parts of the world. So there is uh, a job for people to deal with this. And of course, again, uh, technical solutions to uh, and uh, urban planning solutions to reducing this problem, uh, they are available, but sometimes they are ignored. And uh, uh, for instance, having parks with water features where uh, the fountains and little lakes or ponds evaporate uh, the, the water and by doing that you're cooling down the local area and the local air. Uh, this is uh, something which uh, really should be considered in many cities of the world. If we then look in the next slide on the kind of work that people do in the heat uh, in many parts of the tropical areas, this is uh, sugarcane harvesters in Nicaragua. The harvest period is during the hottest part of the year. They work in the sun <coughs> and uh, generally without any protection. And um, uh, these people are very much uh, exposed to this severe heat. And as the hot levels uh, go higher and higher, it's going to be more and more difficult for them to carry out their work. And in fact, there is an epidemic uh, currently going on in those Central American countries uh, among these uh, sugarcane cutters that is probably related to the heat levels. It hasn't been 100% proven yet, but um, uh, they sweat maybe 10 liters of sweat a day. And they don't replace all that sweat because they haven't got access to enough drinking water. And therefore, they get what we call dehydration. And that is linked to kidney disease. And when these people get kidney disease, they have no insurance and no access to dialysis and transplants and things. So they actually die at very young age from the kidney disease. That's a big problem. The other thing in the next slide shows the reduction of the productivity. This is real life workers in Bengal, outside Kolkata in India. And uh, it shows that um, with an increase of this heat stress index, WBDT, of about five degrees, it cuts down the productivity by uh, 30, 40, or maybe 50 percent. And um, uh, this, of course, um, has economic consequences, not only for the individuals who might be paid by the output of their work, but also for corporations, for communities, for uh, countries even. And this is one area which, uh, again, has not been enough studied uh, in relation to climate change. We shouldn't forget, as we can show in the next slide, that um, even in factories, uh, most of the people who are making <coughs> the 
uh, consumer products that we buy in the shops in the high income countries, most of these workers do not have a protection of, uh, of air conditioning. And this shoe factory in Vietnam, for instance, these women have to work two hours longer in the hot summer period to achieve the same daily output of the number of shoes, which is the target, as uh, during the cooler part of the year uh, in Haiphong and also in Hanoi, it's quite cool in the winter, uh, maybe 15, 20 degrees in the afternoon, while in the summer it's 40 degrees. And it means that uh, the heat problems have to be absorbed, so to say, totally by the workers themselves. They don't get paid anymore, but they have to work longer hours. And they usually work at least 10 to 12 hours a day, so you can imagine the stress that this creates. Now, the next uh, table shows the uh, only calculation available so far of the economic costs of this heat trends that are caused by climate change. And you can see that already in 2030, which is not that far away, this calculation indicates that at the global level, the cost would be uh, more than two trillion US dollars. Uh, and uh, it's an enormous uh, number, of course. Uh, it's still only about 1.5% of the global GDP in 2030, but it's certainly for individual countries like Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, Nicaragua, etc. It can be a great, uh, let's say, break on the economic development, and uh, it's a real problem, or will be a real problem, unless one can overcome the uh, uh, climate change trends and uh, actually reduce them. Next slide shows the four uh, so-called pathway, RCPs, that IPCC and its experts have been using. And uh, <coughs> the RCP 8.5, the top trend there, is um, uh, basically business as usual. We don't do much to reduce the climate change. RCP 2.6 is very dramatic changes and reductions in the greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, it's um, so dramatic reductions that uh, it's not likely to happen. So what really is likely to uh, develop during the next um, uh, decades and this century is RCP 6 or RCP 4.5. But if we don't take uh, the decisions needed at global level, we might even go higher than RCP 6 and maybe closer to RCP 8.5. And it's interesting to think of the timing of this because sometimes we feel, well, uh, you know, the year 2050 is far away, <laughs> 35 years from now. But actually, a child that is born now in 2015 will still be alive at the end of this century very likely, certainly from the high income countries, you live to age 85. And that, that child's grandchild will live to the middle or beyond the middle of the next century. So if we think of the child and the ch grandchild and the child's ch grandchild's child and the grandchild's grandchild, you're coming up to the almost the year 2200. So we should not ignore these very long term trends because even in our own family, our family members in the future are going to be affected by these particular trends. And we calculated in the next um, map that uh, you can look at the most extreme situation with the RCP uh, 8.5, which means business as usual, and <coughs> the uh, places in the world where it is going to be so hot during the hottest days in the hottest month that actually, uh, even if you do no work whatsoever, you're just sitting still, your uh, core body temperature will go from the normal 37 up to 42 degrees. It's only five degrees difference, but at 42 degrees, you will have a 50% chance of dying just because of the high body temperature. So you can see that very large parts of the world will be in this category. And uh, it means that uh, we must absolutely think about the protection of the future generations from these heat levels. Now, a few conclusions then. There's a variety of health risks. I focused on the heat levels on working people here, but there are other experts that could explore in more detail 
the problems with infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, malnutrition, and extreme effects like injuries from storms, etc. Uh, some of these um, uh, health problems that um, already exist in the world uh, will get worse, and we have already, of course, problems with heart disease, with stroke uh, related to the cardiovascular system, etc. And uh, people with those underlying diseases will be more at risk than other people. Uh, we have to think about the uh, co-benefits to health that I mentioned through engineering solutions and other solutions that reduce the greenhouse gases and at the same time protect people from other environmental hazards like the air pollution. We have to think about this environmental heat really as a planetary boundary which is one term that has been brought up in some of the reports recently. And I mentioned here the number of people, the large spread, but it's between 155 and 1900 million people affected by this extreme heat in the year 2200. So basically you cannot survive unless you have air, air conditioning. Now these are uh, definitely planetary boundaries in the sense that we cannot let the planet get to that stage. You know. If you want to know more, I have listed a few readings here. Definitely the IPCC health chapter in its Working Group 2 report from 2014. Some of the illustrations here come from the Kallström and Mark Michael paper 2013 in the journal Global Health Action. And then we have uh, the Lancet journal, a uh, key global medical journal uh, they have produced a number of papers on climate and health related issues and very recently in June 2015 they produced a long report which actually has quite a lot of text also about the prevention of climate change. So that might be uh, an interesting reading for people with a technical background. I should also mention in the next slide that we have now a website at which you can actually go in and uh, see your own area and the climate change modeling data as well as the uh, real current uh, last 30 years of data to see to what extent uh, climate change will take place where you live and where you work. And um, uh, we are uh, always exploring new ways or applying new ways to improve this website so uh, please go back to it even if at the moment <coughs> it's not completed yet and it requires more additional reports and uh, text uh, to it. So there we are and the final slide shows uh, of course our beautiful planet, how it is uh, totally by itself out there in uh, <coughs> space and uh, we have a very very special climate that we live in and we have to make sure that we protect it for future generations. So thank you. That was my little introduction to climate change and health.